and we are officially live. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on the seventh session of the Mobile Growth Summit. My name is Eddie Arrieta. I'm the head of communications at Torre. And today on this panel, we're going to talk about talent acquisition on a budget. Our moderator is going to be Maureen Donovan, CEO at Inde. And uh, Maureen, this is um, all yours, your stage. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us all. So just to get started, um, I will introduce myself and the rest of the panel. So my name is Marin. I am the CEO of Indy, and we really focus on helping connect um, helping prepare candidates to to find meaningful work. And that's why one of the reasons that I was so excited to, to moderate this panel, and I'm so excited to speak with the three experts we have today. So first off, I would love to introduce Andreas Cajeo. And Andreas, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Torre, and you know what brings you here? Of course, thank you so much, uh, Marin, for the introduction. So I am the co-founder and chief girl officer at Torre. We are a new kind of professional network. We're trying to build a career development companion really to, to all that we do. So uh, we're currently the largest remote talent and jobs uh, database that you can find out there. Uh, right now we are over three, 350,000 members and uh, we're, tr we're trying to find ways to connect talent to the most fulfilling professional opportunities as fast as we can. So that's kind of what we, what we do. Awesome, great. And Christina uh, from Scope. I'd love Hi. you to introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Um, Christina Dunbar, uh, Director of Global Talent at Scopely. We are a mobile games uh, publisher and developer based in Los Angeles with uh, actually locations around the globe in uh, Spain, London, uh, and Tokyo, and Dublin, Ireland. Awesome. And last but not least, Michelle from Duist. Hi, thanks, Marin. Um, so yeah, Michelle Lackness, and um, I'm the senior financial analyst at Duist. And Duist is the creator of a couple apps. Uh, one is Todoist, which is a productivity tool. And the other is Twist, which is a team communication platform. Um, we are a fully remote company, and we have um, people that work in over 26 different countries, so definitely a global presence. Um, and we've been around for just over 10 years. So, yeah. And excited to be here today because, yeah, coming from the finance background, but to do as being a small kind of shop, overlapping a lot with people ops, um, we kind of come together a lot when we're talking about hiring and um, acquiring talent. So yeah, looking forward awesome. to Awesome. Well, I'm so glad to have all of you here and we're so excited to chat with the audience. So the topic of the panel is talent acquisition on a budget. And additionally, just kind of in this new economy, we all find ourselves in, in the last you know quarter or so. Um, so first let's touch base on the painfully obvious fact. Because of this global pandemic, companies are laying off great talent in droves. We've seen this with Airbnb, Uber, most businesses that are based on kind of, you know, nice to have or consumer goods, travel, anything hit hard by shelter in place has been doing some massive layoffs. So one thing I would love to, to kind of present to the panel is how someone in our audience should go about tapping into that wash of talent in like an authentic and respect, respectful way. And just what are the pros and cons? So uh, yeah, perhaps we can, if anyone wants to jump on that one. <laughs> um, well, I could say that we have really been um, utilizing the resources that people have created for these uh, communications about these layoffs. Um, there was a, a resource called Parachute List that we found very, very helpful that allowed that um, displaced talent to register and put out their information that companies could access. I think the flood and influx of talent in the market um, is is a you know helpful to us in our search um, 
and we want to be connected to all of those resources. So I think as more things come out, we're just trying to figure out ways to to stay ahead of what's out there so we can get to it quickly um, and, and really um, putting out more communications about how to find us if you're interested in very, very general ways that it doesn't have to be exactly tied to one of our jobs, just so we can start having those conversations. Similarly at Doist, um, we've recognized the situation and we have some great milestones that we're looking to accomplish in the coming years. And we've actually lifted a hiring freeze and we're looking to hire quite a number of uh, new employees coming up here, just partly because we know that there is a flesh uh, within the talent pool right now and we wanna take advantage of that. Um, so that's something that I think we can do. And we're also active as well as I think Christina mentioned too, but in terms of communicating that out within our different platforms and social media and stuff like that to say we're actively hiring. Um, for us, it's always been really important now versus however many years before to always maintain um, consistent, honest, authentic messaging to to people out there and then people if they're looking for a job or customers are attracted to our brand based on our culture not just because we're hiring or something like that or we provide remote work but but they're truly attracted to to the culture and and that's a huge important step when we're hiring because we want to make sure the culture fit is the number one thing Thanks, Michelle. I, I wanted to add to that. I think that right now, the the layoffs that we have been seeing that have been the most mediatic ones, you know, the Airbnbs, the Ubers and so on. Um, I, I, I feel like those professionals that are, you know, getting laid off of, of their $200,000 a year salaries in, in San Francisco um, with six months of compensation, they're going to do well. I, I feel like they're going to be fine. Um, and, and, and I've heard of many of them, some, some of them, my friends, that are like, you know what, I'm done with San Francisco. Francisco, I'm moving away, I'm going to the countryside, I'm going to back back home or whatever it is. And they're taking advantage of this opportunity to just take things slowly and at their pace. But of course, there's uh, a, an entire universe of professionals that don't make the headlines, that don't make the parachute lists, that don't make the traditional uh, uh, media outlets uh, or not do, don't work at companies such as Airbnb and Uber that are still very valuable talent and they are all around the world. One thing that concerns me about this is that we're constructing this cycle of, oh, we're gonna hire the guys from Airbnb, we're gonna hire the guys from Uber, and we're not really giving an opportunity to talent from all around the world to come in and work with us and work alongside us. So many of the companies that I've seen uh, that have been trying to, some respectfully, of course, take advantage of the opportunity, um, I, I wish that they opened their mind a little bit broader and took this as an opportunity to take a chance and go after talent all around, all, all around the world, uh, because definitely unemployment is happening everywhere. Not just the U.S., not just uh, not just Canada, whatever. It's it's happening everywhere, and and definitely opportunities are going to come out uh, from the Silicon Valley area, but also from all around the world. So, uh, since this is the, uh, a talent acquisition on a budget panel, I think that this is a great time for companies to reassess if they really need to continue hiring locally, if they really need to continue hiring within the Bay Area, within New York, within LA, or perhaps they can open their borders to other countries. And I feel like that is going to be the biggest opportunity because the talent that has been working remotely for a while from Georgia, from Colombia, from all around the world, the best of the best, they may have had their jobs impacted and they may be uh, available as well. So you might as well take advantage of that and start working with the best of the best remote anywhere they are. So I, I, I hope that that's a, an opportunity companies take advantage of. Yeah, I agree. And Not I think... That's something that yeah. we've done at Duis since the beginning, being fully remote, is really leveraged on the global talent that is out there. Um, and in terms of, there's the pro, if you wanna look at it as well, in terms of being more cost effective. Um, but then also in terms of how do you find that talent, which I think was part of, part of uh, Marin's question, is utilizing the different platforms that are out there like Remotive or Remote Hub, or we work remotely, um, or di just different platforms out there to kind of see. And I also think a lot has changed within the last couple of years that there are so many more services to put people that have experience working remotely or wish to get experience 
um, to work remotely and, and access those job boards um, and get in contact with uh, the different, the companies that can offer that. I certainly think that there is an, another pro in, in this, um, if we're trying to do silver linings of, of the pandemic, um, this is really opening up our, our hiring managers to look at talent that comes from industries that maybe weren't in games. You know, games is very niche and it is usually the experience that our companies are looking for to hire somebody that has done that, has seen that success. And we're finding that there are loads of great people from engineers to, to lawyers that have worked in other other industries and other companies that are now available in the market. And so this is really opening more of an opportunity for us to have a more diverse candidate pool than maybe we had before and um, look at how other people from other industries can come into games and see how much fun we have. <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, that kind of leads in directly into the next question, which is just around recruiting and retaining remote talent. Um, you know, it's it's definitely cost effective or it can be cost effective. It's amazingly diverse. One thing I love about remote is just that it's the great equalizer. Um, but yeah, Michelle, uh, before the panel, we talked about kind of the in pro inverse problem with hiring remote, you know, versus if you're in a in a city that's pretty compl uh, competitive, you're doing a lot of outbound sources. When you open up to the world, you could have anywhere from a few hundred candidates to absolutely thousands. How does Doist approach this to kind of find the best candidates in that fit between person and role? Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. I think a big part of what what we do is we're not, we definitely are obviously hiring because there's a need and we really focus on not over, over hiring, but um, also it's so important for us to always make sure that the candidate is the right fit. So there's also this kind of balance of not rushing or looking to find the right candidate from the thousands of people that are there. So I'd like to say that the first part, first, first off is that like that right fit is so important to us um, but then to suss it out within the pool of candidates that we have some things that we've we've done that have worked really well for us our turnover rate is less than five percent over the last 10 years but um, is looking at personal projects that uh, people might have so also really digging into the portfolio of something that they've built. We've had a lot of candidates come forward and say, here's your project, I've actually built something, um, or your product, here. I've actually built something here, take a look at my work and really be able to prove um, their capabilities through, through portfolios or through personal projects, like I mentioned. The other thing um, as well is through, we've done a lot of like freelance hired freelancers that have then over time been able to kind of prove um, what their work's like and, and who they are. And then that then can become a per more permanent position as well. Um, and then the biggest part when we're kind of starting from scratch is we do have, like I said before, we really hire based on culture fit too. Obviously looking for very smart people that fit our culture. And with that said, we have a large committee because we're all remote. Um, so we have people from different areas within the organization to really see and suss out what are their communication styles because that's very important when you're working remotely. Um, what are their values and beliefs? Is that something that really mes meshes with ours? Um, and kind of getting that, those larger committee um, opinions kind of to, to put on that that person and to, to really interview and, and get that out of um, that process. Oh, great. Okay. And Andreas, how about that have never hired a remote before? What have you seen work and what doesn't too? 
Thanks for the question, Marin. So, so as for the question, uh, companies that have never hired remote and they're being forced to hire remote now, it's a very interesting challenge because it may not be obvious what the differences are between finding talent locally in your city in and in your area and finding talent remotely. Uh, but I think that Michelle really pointed out at something that it's it's a, it's a significant difference, and that is, uh, you when you're recruiting locally for San Francisco. New York, Los Angeles, whatever it is, uh, or even where you're recruiting locally in even smaller cities. Uh, I don't know. I come from Bogota. We're a 10 million city, but we're not, of course, we're not as uh, competitive as you will, you will have people in, in SF or, or uh, New York and so on. Um, so when you're recruiting in these spaces, in these bubbles, uh, you are in a market where you are um, selling your company to the talent. Right, you're going out and selling your business and saying, "Hey, hey, guys, come here and attract me talent your way." When you when you hire remotely, immediately you start getting a bunch of candidates coming your way, and the inbound is just way bigger. So you're no longer in a selling mode; you're in a buying mode. And even for top engineering roles, uh, there's there's a difference. Of course, if you want to go for the very best of the best, you always have to sell. Of course, uh, and and of course, it depends on the area that you're working on. But there are many differences that come from just that perspective. And uh, recruiters that don't know how to um, approach this market dynamics the, the appropriate way may be losing on great talent and great opportunities just because of the lack of understanding of how the different cultures and the dynamics work. So let me give you an example. You could have a React developer in San Francisco making high hundreds uh, of thousands of, of, uh, of dollars, um, and, and you can have the same quality of talent working out of Georgia, working, working out of Ukraine, working out of Colombia, uh, for significantly less money. And since compensation is one of the very first factors that we as human beings consider when considering a job uh, offer, um, it's, it's, we, we look at that and, and, and it's normal. We see, well, why would I hire a 200, well, we'll hire a, a 30K engineer when I have the budget to hire a 200K one. But reality is that May, they may both have the same skill set. They may both be able to deliver the same kind of work. And so you really don't want to miss out on those opportunities, uh, especially if you're in a position like most San Francisco-based companies or more Silicon Valley uh, or VC-backed companies where you have the capital to do it. The fact that you have the capital to invest in talent does not mean that you have to um, neglect yourself to, to the world. So I think that that's one of the, the, the first differences. And of course, the second and, and, and I think very important one, uh, just reinforcing on, on what Michelle said and what they do at Duis, they're really at the forefront of this, uh, is there are many nuances to understanding and building human relationships and bonds. And so the traditional recruiter shows the office off, has people come over and meet people in, on different meeting rooms and uh, explains the history of the company and they walk together around the building and so on. And, and all these different activities, they may seem you know, um, simple in a way, but in reality, they're very powerful. They're very important to transmitting the vision of the company, what you guys are trying to accomplish, to transmitting what do you want from this role and allowing the person to really soak in who you are. And the question then goes to how do you do that completely remotely through a, through a video conference call? So there's, of course, a lot of nuances in the process that go way beyond that, as in how do you do technical testing? How do you do screening? How do you do like... Uh, should you do video screening questions? Should you do written screening questions? What about the technical tests? There's a lot of engineers that don't like technical tests. There's a lot of them that challenge them often. So there's a lot of nuances. And I think that uh, recruiters need to, hit, to, to have their mind open and learn from recruiters that have already done this in the past. Uh, there's several resources out there. Duist has a lot of them. Uh, GitLab has a lot of them. And I feel like to do it right, you definitely want to learn from those that did it wrong for a long time and learn how to do things you know, uh, a better way. Just so people have something super actionable, what are what are some of the best uh, platforms or maybe job boards for people to go if they want to, you know, post remote jobs or look at remote talent? Well, I'm going to be use? completely biased on that one, and <laughs> I, I'm going to jump in and be completely biased on that one right from the yep. get go. Uh, and I have to say, try to out. Uh, and the reason why I say this is. Uh, the vast majority of the platforms that are out there, job boards, they're just job boards, and it's fine. They, they they work well. You post your job. There's a lot of people seeing you. You're buying a lot of eyeballs that apply to your job. But 
finding talent is way more than just getting people to apply and getting resumes your way, right? So, so in my case, I have to advocate for my platform, uh, and I'm more than happy to give all, all of the users here a, a personalized onboarding if that's what we need. Um, so you can see, you know, how we go about screening and how we go about ranking candidates and and going through them because it's it's a way different recruiting locally and recruiting remotely. It's a way different world, and that's something I believe that we understand. Yeah, I've definitely actually passed on Torre name. Also, that's a oh, great offer too, the, the personal onboarding. <laughs> uh, to our people opt. Um, we use, also use Workable, but that's more like a tool. But um, I think another thing, I, I mean, this is a virtual conference, but something that has brought a, quite a few people into Doist is through conferences. Um, which is a bit interesting because that's the opposite of remote hiring that's in person. Um, but building that rapport or those relationships through networking um, in conferences that, ha that has helped. But in terms of, I think I had already mentioned three of the different kind of boards that we use, but there's so many out there as well. But those are other tactics too. Christina, what have you guys used? What do you use now? What have you used in the past? So we have a LinkedIn suite with our ATS and kind of our job posting. So, you know, LinkedIn is a, is a very big tool for us, along with our own company website. We're not posting anything remotely. We're hiring remotely circumstantially, not because that is our model. And so uh, we are still posting in the same ways that we always have. And we are still reviewing candidates and making those considerations in the way that we have. Um, and then making the right accommodations for this remote situation that we're experiencing right now. Okay, cool. And actually I have, a, I have another question kind of on that for you. Um, one of the concerns that people have when hiring remote uh, or even just working remote right now is like, what does it look like when when we go back to in office, um, depending on those who, who started out in office? You mentioned, Christina, that the gaming industry is booming and at Scopely that you guys are planning on going back in office, you know, when you can. Um, how are you taking advantage of different geographies uh, to get great talent through that the hub model that you guys have with your different um, different bases? I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. It's almost kind of like the the perfect model between in house and remote. So we have always been very open to all geographies to find top talent, and we now having different locations throughout the world have a little bit easier of a way to bring people into working into our locations um, because of where we're set up ge uh, geographically. But um, we haven't let where somebody is currently based stop us from that conversation or consideration. Uh, we are a company that is very strong in, in our relocation offering. Um, we are now starting to look at what would the next world look like if we do a uh, remote and an on-site workforce? And is that possible? And how do we get some of, over some of these uh, geographical challenges right now, just based on the fact that people are sheltered in place and so they can't even get to one of those hubs that they could be hired out of? And so um, I, was, I was saying to Michelle earlier, like we were not proactive in this because we hadn't planned to be a remote workforce prior to coronavirus. And so um, we are learning and researching every day on how we continue to um, connect and engage with top talent um, and not let this pandemic or the situation stop us from being able to work with them. Um, but there are you know, challenges of being able to just hire anybody where they are, um, especially if they're not open to a contract or, you know, we don't have that ability to have them as a contractor. So um, we're hoping that we are starting to see a clear picture as we move through this and as different legislations start to lift um, their their restrictions and start starting to put these phases out to um, allow people back into somewhat of what normalcy was. Uh, but it's all really to be determined as we go. 
as so many things are right now, especially. Um, and just to, to touch base on two more questions uh, before we, we have to go to the, the Q&A, um, we discussed earlier that another great way to find amazing talent is kind of a throwback. It's like the the idea of internships and apprentices are taking off again. Um, Andreas, you mentioned the lost generation of new grads, you know, over the next few years and how you've seen companies approach that talent. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm taking a deep look into that because, uh, of course, this is something that has always happened with, when an economic recession comes around, right? We have the lost generation, the people that graduate, and they can't find jobs because just of the situation with the jobs marketplace. And the problem is not so much that, but that afterwards, you know, in a year or two years or three years as the economy starts to recover, um, well, the companies are going to start hiring again, but they're going to hire the ones that are going to be graduating in one or two or three years because why would they hire someone that got stuck for so long, um, you know, doing absolutely nothing, quote unquote. So, uh, of course, we we want to take a look into this because there's a huge opportunity here um, for trying to connect talent with alternative way, with alternative ways of growing professionally. And something that we have received a lot, a lot of great feedback from, from companies is companies understand the problem. They understand that if we don't give our youth an opportunity to grow professionally through these times, they will be set very, very back, uh, uh, very far uh, back. So we we want to make sure that we give them opportunities, even if we can't allocate additional resources to hiring more people or, or or whatever. So there are many alternatives to that, of course. You know, internships, apprenticeships. In some cases, some countries they are mandatory. Companies need to hire interns. And if you want to if you want to restart your economy, you, you want to do that as well. Uh, but I feel that we're going to see more of a, of an even further throwback. I, I like the usage of the throwback there, and that is going back to even the ancient Greece and how we used to learn. We used to do a lot of peer to peer learning. We used to do a lot of mentoring, uh, and that has kind of faded over the time. Uh, but I know that all human beings are passionate about sharing their knowledge, about being the mentors to someone else. So um, we have been getting a lot of very good feedback and response from from companies from leaders organizations, uh, I, I just call them up. I'm like, hey, would you consider getting one or two apprentices to work with you to get some experience, uh, you know, for free or for or, or for cheap, quote unquote, uh, just so that they keep going, they keep learning. And everyone that I call, they're like, yeah, of course, send them my way. Of course, they want to have good talent, fast growing people and, and, and so on. But you always find that on the marketplace. So I think it's going to be a great opportunity for the future and something that everyone, all of us just should consider is opening ourselves to being the mentors uh, to, to someone else on an on a, on a ongoing basis. Yeah. And I love that it's a win win, which is amazing. Michelle, you also mentioned that, you know, Duist is about, has really focused on sustainable growth, not over hiring, and that you guys utilize internships programs heavily too. Maybe just briefly, you could touch on kind of, you know, what you've learned from that. Yeah, we have in the past, um, and definitely something that we continue to consider. I think it's twofold. Part of it, it's a great way to try someone on for size in a remote environment because you can really see it's kind of like a, a probationary period too when you have an intern um, to see you know what is their potential you know where can they really go from here and is this a good fit so that's partly I think where the initial kind of impetus came for, with using the internship programs um, is our remote nature. But then also, obviously, it's, it's cost effective, too, um, in, in that side of things. So that's something that we've found has worked really well for us for, for those two reasons, because it kind of two birds with one stone. And then also, um, we've had really, really great success with that. So we've had people come in and have really grown and stayed with the company and they're now in permanent senior positions too. So that's something um, that, yeah, we've definitely utilized going forward. Um, we're looking to continue to do that, but for some of our needs, the more junior internship roles um, isn't what we're quite looking for right at this time, but I think we'll continue to dip back into that because um, it can be really useful. Yeah, it's it's exciting. I actually love that model. Um, so lastly, before we open up for questions, a really interesting way of um, interacting with great talent, especially kind of in a in a budget or more scalable way is through the gig economy, whether you're leveraging micro tasks, platforms or long term freelancers. 
Um, Christina, do you guys do you guys do that much at Scopely? Have you have you noticed uh, anything around those trends? I think that we've remained pretty consistent through this as to the amount of usage, which I would say is less than 10%. Uh, there are some okay. some assignments that come up that are very, um, very open for a, a freelancer, maybe um, a certain ad design or um, an animation or a, um, a narrative story or something like that, that, you know, it makes sense to do go to a freelancer that has that expertise, but um, it's not something that we use often. Okay. Uh, Andreas, you had mentioned the idea of crews or, you know, groups of people uh, working together or, or then also the idea of starting out either part-time before going full-time. Where have you seen this working best? Yeah, I, I've seen this working a lot with uh, agencies. Agencies are a good example, and, and and even the example that Christina gave us, the animation side. Um, it's pretty common for agencies to to hire uh, boutique agencies to help with some creative work, to help with some specific projects, to help with some specific tasks. Uh, in the end, of course, any project needs a collaboration of multiple people. Uh, there are such, some challenges uh, big companies have or organizations have to to hiring these teams, to hiring these crews. Uh, they need to have some sort of structure behind them, a company behind them, and so on, which makes it a little bit difficult. And of course, how do you integrate uh, the 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 culture and the processes of the of the client with with those of the um, of the seller, right? So so I feel like in the future, and and this is a great opportunity for app developers for for uh, platforms like ours and and so on. We're gonna have more of this happening. We're gonna have more crews that are assembled by potentially AI that are put together with certain. Uh, structure of culture of way of, of doing things uh, and that will be put to a task specifically get that done and moving to the next thing um, and that would be very powerful and very helpful for a lot of organizations because they'll be able to uh, get this done through even apis and this is this is this sounds like the future but it's a reality for one of the companies in my holding nowadays uh, bunny studios bunny studios assembles creative teams of people that do creative ads voiceovers videos and so on in real time and they can do a product turnover in, in as little as 30 minutes uh, and you can request it through an API. So we have several large advertisers uh, in this company that they just send a request through an API to create an ad, a creative piece of ad that will show on you know, radio or whatever. Uh, and it's done in you know, 30 minutes, one hour, 24 hours, whatever the turnaround time is, uh, without the intervention of, of human beings coordinating the work. It's all AI. So we already see it, we already do it in one of the companies of my holding. And I see that this is going to be the future for, for the rest of the categories as well. The interesting thing is, um, at my last company, we actually took the the role of a recruiter, like what they normally call a full cycle recruiter. We actually broke it into five distinct uh, disciplines. And so that allowed us to have different people working on very focused um, at different levels. And exactly what you said, Andreas, it made everything come come together faster, but like just more was done than one individual could do. And by having different levels of seniority, um, you know, some people are very junior, but they're more administrative and they can learn quickly. I think the idea of a crew, like, you know, similar to movie or production crews is kind of amazing in some ways, because not only does it allow businesses to get work done fast, as long as it's managed in quality, but it allows, kind of going back to the apprentice thing, it allows people to learn on the job. It gives opportunities, you know, it, it really democratizes opportunities. Um, yeah, Michelle, have you guys, uh, have you guys leveraged that at all at Doist or have you seen that much? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely part of our model. Um, like I was saying before, in terms of actually bringing someone on permanently, that has been one of the routes that people have taken. Um, but in terms of our day to day, we translate um, our product and communications in, I think, over 15 different languages. So we freelance translators, uh, illustrations, like a lot of our marketing stuff. So we're constantly within that market and supporting that market to of freelancers and, and sourcing that, that talent out, too, um, because it's definitely, again, the ability to leverage global talent um, for some of the little niche projects that we use for in terms of like engineering we typically keep that to like in-house engineers for our core product it is something that we're actually recently talking about for some of these other 
services in terms of like finance projects that we need engineer support for or marketing or things like that maybe that's something that we should start looking at out of house since we're running our engineers pretty to the bone right now so um so yeah so it but it's definitely been part of our model and been really useful awesome I guess uh, kind of uh, on the five to ten years, especially you know any any kind of radical thought and let and and not lose them now, or just as so much shifts. Sorry, Marin, you were really broken up for us, so I don't think any of us really caught the question. I think you're back now. So Maybe. I think so we are just we... saying um, what are <laughs> Good. We, we can hear you now, I think. Yes, I think we can. Okay, great. Uh, what are our pro projections for the next five, five years? Talent, what are the, you know, maybe the things you guys are excited about or think will happen? I certainly think the pandemic is going to um, make all companies in all industries think about the way that they hire and the way people that the way people work. Um, you know, bravo to you know the people that were not remote workers that became remote workers that really have made the shift, and it's been um, growing pains and and learning and iterating. And so I think that uh, what the future holds is going to be the way that companies really um, view their workforce and um, can it can it be a dual model can it can more things move to like doist and be all remote um, I'm I'm very eager to see what lies ahead yeah I agree I think like you said to echo the pandemic has really opened the doors and and allowed I think people to be put first within their organization um, because it gives a uh, organizations are looking at it. Wait, our current structure is this isn't the only way. What are the other options out there to work and work really well and and produce some really great products and all these other things and give the people that work for us the option and to have a better balance. And that's definitely something at do that we constantly focus on is we really want to create the future that we want to work in. And that's sort of why we went remote um, to provide and really promote more balanced, fulfilling ways of working. But I think just that little touch is now kind of in the conversations and every um, company is starting to think about that. And I do think that's a way to put people first within the organization, um, which I think will be fruitful down the line too for for all parties involved. So I'm I'm excited for that. I I think that uh, we're at a point where you know one out of three professionals are out of work, and what this does is that it just makes everyone rethink uh, a lot of things, especially in their careers and what they're pursuing uh, professionally and how they make their income. Um, you know, we had a, a situation in which in the last financial uh, crisis, 2008, it brought up some of the most important gig economy platforms that we see and we use nowadays, like Uber, like Airbnb, and so many others. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like this is going to be a great opportunity for us as humanity to really rethink the way we work in many ways. Uh, I've been having uh, chats about how to make work fulfilling every day. We have been having those chats for like the past two months since this whole thing started. And we have been able to chat with people who work from cabins in the middle of a forest and, you know, one hour away from Tallinn and Estonia. 
and and also from people who are working from their Manhattan uh, penthouse and they're tired of it and tired of sick of it and they want to move away uh, and and also people that are that are considering changing careers and and doing more of freelancing or doing less of this or, or, or whatever so I think it's a great opportunity to just rethink many of the things we take for granted like do we really need to live out of big cities that are super expensive and are that uh, that are mass for traffic do we really need to work uh, as full-time employees all the time uh, or maybe we want to consider more flexibility of being freelancers uh, do we want to continue uh, working on professional careers that are not fulfilling for us or maybe we will take the chance of being unemployed to explore new careers to explore new avenues and I feel like any any other you know crisis any other situation that puts us to to test uh, it allows us to reflect on that and of course I don't expect everyone to come out of this with a completely changed life or whatever uh, I'm more than happy for those that are happy with what they have and their careers and so on right now and they're fulfilled with them um, but for many of those that perhaps there's a need for new opportunities, for new avenues to, to go. Uh, I think that this is a moment where we're all at home reflecting about that. And not only those that are looking for new opportunities, but also for those that are building it, like Michelle, like Christina, uh, who are building those avenues for those people who are building the platform so that we can work with people wherever they are, whatever kind of a structure they like, if they like to be full-time, they would like to be freelancers, whatever they like to do. Um, I'm really, I, I, I'm really humbled by you know the avenues that are being built by the teams in this in this meeting, uh, and the more that will be built through these conversations. I think we're like getting our MC and losing our MC, and so um, for anyone who might be watching this, um, I think there's only a couple minutes left, and I'm not sure if we'll really get to questions, and I certainly don't know how to get to them, uh, so. I, I'm not sure if our information is shared, but I'm happy to follow up on anybody's questions via email. Same. And thank you, everyone. I think you can all hear me, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. I think we only have two minutes left. Uh, I think you've already given your parting thoughts. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much, Andres. And thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, joining us today. And Marine, of course, her internet was perfect all the way until the end. But thank you, everyone. Uh, as you know, you can find uh, Christina, Michelle, Andres, and Maureen um, over LinkedIn as well. Uh, I just did that. Uh, so uh, it's super easy to do that. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And um, uh, have, have a good time. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.